Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. Steve McGlynn is the Republican candidate for the Illinois 5th District Appellate Court. He, uh, he'll be on the ballot November 6th. The Appellate Court, or Appeals Court, hears appeals from litigants who are not satisfied with the outcome of their trial. The Appellate Court job is to review the decisions of lower courts and ensure that people's rights are protected and that the law was followed. In 2005, the Illinois Supreme Court appointed Steve McLean to serve as an Appellate Court Justice for this same 5th District Appellate Court. He was defeated at the November 2006 election. September of 2010, Judge McLean was appointed by the Illinois Supreme Court to be a circuit judge at large in the 20th Judicial Circuit. He has been rated as highly qualified by his peers at the Illinois State Bar Association. Steve McGlynn, welcome to Conversation. Thanks for having me, Lee. I really should call you Judge. You're, you are currently I'm not wearing my robe. I don't get hung But up you on are it. a judge now in the, in the 20th, is that I right? Am. Okay. Well, just, just let's start out so that people understand how the judicial system uh, operates and how it's built in the state of Illinois. If you have a dispute, uh, you would bring your cases... Uh, in the uh, most cases you would bring in the circuit court. If it's a criminal matter or the state has an action, they would bring it in the criminal court, in the, in the circuit court. So circuit court, that's first level. First that's the first round. level. First now, level. now there, is, there, there is are some administrative law things. If you, like workers' compensation, doesn't go initially to the courts. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you apply for unemployment insurance or a number of, of things like that, it goes through an administrative uh, body. Uh, and if you don't like the decision of the administrative body, you appeal it to the circuit court. And then from there, it works its way up. Now, is probate within the circuit? Probate is within the circuit court. Right. And if you have a, uh, um, you get a ticket, that's also that's the circuit. That's also circuit court. Although that's normally handled by an associate. Those are normally assigned to associate. The traffic What's dockets. the difference between an associate to court judge and, and a circuit judge in Illinois? The, the, it's the way they're selected. Uh, associate circuit judges are appointed by uh -huh. a vote of the circuit judges. Okay. The circuit judges uh, are either appointed by the Supreme Court to fill a vacancy or they're elected into the office. Mm -hmm. Once they're, they've been elected into the office, then every six years they're up for retention. Yes or no. We keep this judge, we don't keep this judge. So it's not re-election, it's retention. It's retention. So unless people say no, is that a majority? I mean, sixty percent have to say we want to keep this judge on uh -huh. the job. Okay, so if sixty percent don't say yes, then the answer then the is bye bye. Is, right, the judge is not retained. Now, does that create a vacancy that the Supreme Court fills? That's what that's what happens. That's how I got on the court to begin with. The voters in two thousand four chose not to retain Justice Mag in the appellate court, which created a vacancy. So the Supreme Court at that time appointed a bipartisan Blue Ribbon Committee. They looked at lawyers and judges throughout Southern and Central Illinois, and they selected me to serve on the appellate court. Mm -hmm. Would uh, somebody, if, if say, um, oh, let's see, Judge Callis uh, is now seeking retention, okay? Mm -hmm. And you say that's for a six-year term? That would be for a six-year term, yes. Right. So let's just say that people, she did not get her 60% vote, okay? So she's not retained. Does the court appoint somebody to replace Judge Callis for six years? Or no. is there like a special election somewhere it's, in there? It's, uh, first of all, I think Ann Callis has done a good job as a judge. Well, I, I, and, I just and I I think was that, trying oh, to think of a name. I understand. And so it's like, I understand. could have said Judge uh, A.B. And she served as the chief judge of the, of the circuit for Madison. That, that's Madison and Bond. Right. But uh, if she is not retained by the voters, uh, just as with Justice Mag, the Supreme Court would appoint a judge and the next general election there would be an election um, for a full term. So whoever the Supreme Court would, would appoint, if that person would remain a judge, uh, he or she would run in a contested election, not a retention. Uh, so that's 
I was appointed in 2010 as a circuit judge, mm -hmm. and I, my term uh, ends as a circuit judge in December. So I either was to I would either run for a full term as a circuit judge uh, in a contested election, or uh, what I've opted to do, and that is to run for a full term as an appellate judge mm -hmm. and, with, with an opponent. And the uh, the term. Oh, well, let's go on to the uh, and and before we go any further, let me turn to the camera and say, Judge Callis. I didn't intend <laughs> to target you. Uh, I just happened to see your sign today, and so I knew your name. Um, so now we're moving on from the circuit to the appellate system. Uh, how many appellate courts are there in the state of Illinois? There are five. And essentially what you have is one district is Cook County. Uh, and then the southern third of the state, which is the largest district, uh, the fifth district is over 17,000 square miles. It comes from the, it's say from the Metro East up to just to the, to Springfield, just south of Springfield, all the way over to Indiana and everything south of that. So all the way down to Kentucky. And then there is, there's uh, three other districts that, uh, kind of, kind of make up what we consider the collar counties in Chicago area. And then the central part of the state and the, uh, the northwest part of the state. Mm -hmm. And then finally, then there's the Illinois then Supreme Court. Then there's the Supreme Court. Court. And how many members of the Supreme Court are there? Seven. Seven. And you have, you have an absolute right to an appeal to the appellate court in a criminal matter or in a, um, uh, a civil matter. You don't have an absolute right to the appeal to the Supreme Court. Um, except for in very limited circumstances. So they get to pick and choose the cases that they take so the, from the appellate system. That's correct. That's correct. Now so that's the same thing for, the for most people, yeah, and for most people, uh, if they appeal a case, uh, once they get to the appellate court, that's, that's, uh, um, they've pretty much exhausted their remedies. How much does it usually cost to carry a case from the uh, from the circuit level up to the appellate level? It it depends significantly. Uh, I mean, it. it I'm talking people about a, a real case a in real which case. there are business interests and there's two it sides fighting it out. It depends on how how big the record is, how many issues on appeal. But it's not uncommon for a party to spend twenty five to fifty thousand dollars. Uh, appealing a case from the circuit court to the appellate court. Mm -hmm. uh, with, if you think about a divorce case, uh, often uh, that is less, less expensive. Uh, and it depends on how many issues are, are being disputed, the amount in controversy. Mm -hmm. uh, if you lose at the circuit court level uh, and you're not insured, you have to post a bond. So you have to post a bond for the judgment amount plus the interests and court costs that one would expect through the life of the appeal. So it can be very expensive to go to the appellate court. Mm -hmm. and, and, then, and, and that's a problem with our court system. I think, I think we've become, as a society, we've become over-regulated and we've become over-litigated. In, in some ways, and I, I hold the, the judges responsible, we, we have to be able to make sure that people can get justice in a way that they can get their day in court, they can have their case heard on appeal without it costing them a fortune. And uh, so the judges, the judges have a responsibility to make sure that our system works for everybody, not just the ones that have the money and the power uh, to be able to, to afford the litigation. What would, <clears throat> what would a legitimate reason or series of reasons be for someone to go from the circuit to the appellate? Well, the judge could just get it wrong. We're human. What, we all make mistakes. What do you mistakes. mean by the judge can get it wrong? Well, get what wrong? Anything. The judge could get wrong on on a determination about child custody. The judge could get it wrong on a determination of who was who was guilty in a um, a criminal case or uh, who was at fault in a traffic accident. The judge could get an instruction wrong to the jury, or he could uh, or she could uh, make the wrong ruling uh, on an evidentiary matter that would be outcome determinative. You don't get to get this evidence into trial. Is so this it's where kept out and the appellate court could say, well, we think the judge made a mistake and we think if that evidence would have got before the jury, the jury may have reached a much different conclusion. Now, is this where you see on TV the lawyers stand up, objection! Yeah. That, and, and it's from that object. What does the exception mean? 
You, you see that. Take on exception TV. to the note that we take exception to your ruling, Judge. You don't have to do that in Illinois courts. Uh, the um, in some states, uh, the process is you make an objection. If you want to preserve that objection for appeal, uh, if the judge rules against you, you, you say, you say accept. exception. Uh -huh. You take exception to that, and it's made part of the record. I Illinois don't, courts, we don't, we don't have to do that. I don't think that r people realize just how formalized and ritualized the, the court system is, which is why it's a bad idea to represent yourself uh, before a court. Well, I have the largest foreclosure docket south of, of Cook and the Collars. Uh, I think I just have a little bit more than my good friend Judge Stobbs, who handles the foreclosure docket in Madison County. And most of the people that are there that are getting foreclosed on are representing themselves. The fact of the matter is, is that sometimes you just can't afford to represent yourself. The, and, and so I work very hard to, to let the litigants know uh, what their rights are, explain how the process, I can't give legal advice, but I can explain the process. Here's what we're doing in these steps. And, and encourage them, tell me what it is. I know the law. Uh, there's not magical words in my courtroom. You tell me as best you can what you think is important and what you think is relevant. Give me documents that you think are relevant. I'll look at it. And if, it, if you have a defense or you have uh, something that, that could change the outcome of what the other side is asking for, then it, it, I can be able to protect your rights. But there's a lot of people that just, they don't have the money. They're, instead of paying a, money, paying a lawyer, um, they're trying to save their house. Now, sometimes um, people think that the, the amount of money the lawyer is asking for is not a good investment for them. More times than not, it generally is a good investment for them. Uh, most lawyers in the Metro East would be very good at sitting down with a client and telling them, look, I think you have a defense here or you do have a case here. I'm not going to make you throw good money after bad. Um, so it's, it is worth talking to a lawyer. But we as judges, um, we have to be prepared on a daily basis to, to deal with people who don't have a lawyer. They're nervous as all get out when they get in here. They don't know what's happening. They're fearful because they're not represented by a lawyer that somehow they're going to be taken advantage of. So it's very important for judges to have the right kind of demeanor, the right kind of approach, uh, to talk to them so they feel like, I've got my day in court. The judge heard what I wanted him to hear. He seemed to understand. And when he explained his ruling, it made sense to me. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fair. People have to have confidence in our system. Yes. They have right. to have confidence in our system. And when they don't, it really, it, it really hurts. I have, uh, and this is like off a tangent. Um, I, I Not have, you, I have, <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have sat at, uh, in uh, small claims courts mm -hmm. and watched that happen. Now, I have seen judges, like you have described, who seem to be, you know, trying to help people who come before the court, try to help them out because they're not represented and the other side is. On the other hand, I've seen plenty of times where the people who are represented, they get head of line privileges, the judge talks to that, to that lawyer because they're simpatico, and the third party, you know, the one unrepresented, just sort of stands there mute. I agree. And it's, I have seen that too as a lawyer, and it's always bothered me. And when I, when I get on the bench, I know that people are watching, and, they, and they're looking for you to set the tone. Is this a fair courtroom? What's going to happen here? And you're right. It's always bothered me when I've seen judges treat these busy dockets like it's a cattle call. And they don't look up. They don't look at the people. They don't ask them questions. It's, um, it's just you know, paperwork. It's, it's, it's just, just paperwork. paperwork. You know, they're and signing documents and moving it along, handing it to the clerk. Right. And you know, even in traffic court, people there's frustrating things about maybe why they were pulled over. They thought that it was a a bad arrest or something like that. You have to listen to them. You have to listen to every one of them. Now, a lot of them will come in that have have excuses that aren't particularly valid under the law, but at least they get heard. And uh, so I take time, even though we, the, uh, I have one of the, um, the best uh, dockets in the state as far as moving the, the uh, cases along on foreclosures. Uh, one of the things the Bar Association said about me when they evaluated me, talked to the lawyers and the court staff, is 
Judge McGlynn is particularly good with pro se litigants, people representing themselves, taking the time to talk to them. Because mm -hmm. when they do walk out, you know, they want to know, is this, was I treated fair? And, uh, and hopefully they leave your courtroom and they think, okay, I now know why the judge did what he did, or I know why, I'm, why I lost this case, or I know why this particular decision went the way it did. One of the things you see a lot of in, in foreclosure, now I'm going to go off on a tangent, okay. is, is you see that people will get a loan at a bank uh, or some local uh, entity, and then it's sold off. And when the foreclosure is filed, it's not, it's not you know, the local bank of Belleville. It is you know, Bank of New there. York. Yes, and I think, right. how I have never done any business with Bank of New York. So you go through, the judge goes through, looks at that, explains how this worked, and then think, okay, now I understand. All right. It follows the holder of the note. That bank sold your note to uh, these other banks up the food line, and, and, and that's where we are. Few weeks but it's ago, little we, things like that. A few that weeks helps. ago, we had a discussion about uh, the banks and this whole nonsense where people were just sitting in line signing or basically forging robo, doc. Did you? Robo. Did you? Uh, has that come before your court? It did, and it when I I've been I've had this docket for over two years, and it was just getting addressed when uh, I got on the bench. I had previous experience uh, working in bank and doing loans. So I, even though I had a huge docket, I'd take every single file and I would go through it. And I'd be able to, to look and see uh, in reading it what looked right, what didn't look right. Uh, there were some programs that we had. There was um, a lot of the problems tended to be coming from certain law firms uh, and certain banks. And uh, fortunately for me, a lot of that had kind of worked its way through the system. Um, most of the stuff wasn't wasn't a fraud in the sense that they were making it up, that you know these people weren't in default or they didn't know what they said. It was just people were signing these things that they were too busy and didn't know what they're doing. So what we as judges did is we forced them, you gotta, you gotta go back and start over from the beginning, and get somebody that has reviewed these documents, that can say under oath, uh, all the things that they're swearing to is true, and then you can proceed forward. Mm -hmm. So, which apparently has taken a couple of years, but now it, it has. Now, it has. The, now they have gone through that whole cycle, and now the foreclosures are. That's why your docket, I guess, is so big. Because One of the they have. Reasons. They've now come to the point where they've cleared up the mess, and so the people who haven't paid haven't paid. I want to move back to talking sure. about the appellate courts now. Okay, so you're you're wanting again to sit on the uh, the fifth appellate. Yes. Um, I'd like you to state why you think that this would be a good place for you to be, as opposed to the circuit, and uh, what you hope to accomplish there. Well, first of all, I love being a circuit judge. I'd be happy to continue to serve as a judge. Being a judge is a great honor. And, but on the appellate court, the one thing you can do in the appellate court is if you, can, if you get it right on the appellate court, uh, that spreads throughout all the circuits because the circuit judges below you have to follow the written decisions, published decisions of the appellate court. So that's a great opportunity for you to make sure that mistakes that are being made are corrected um, and that when other judges are facing the same kind of cases, they don't make the, the same mistakes others do. Mm -hmm. if, if there is an injustice in the system, if there are abuses in the system, as a circuit judge, it's difficult to address that because those guilty abuses can take a change from you. But if you get to the appellate court, then you can address the abuses, not just the ones that would be in your particular courtroom as a circuit judge, but the hundreds of courtrooms throughout southern and central Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, so that gives us a, that gives us a great opportunity uh, to serve. And I have to tell you, I was the president of Catholic Social Services, uh, chairman of the, I wasn't the president, I was chairman of the board and for southern Illinois. And I watched when the state came and started trying to push this, this entity around because of its religious values. Now, we were the highest rated nonprofit uh, agency in the state doing, that, was, that was doing business with the state. And we were doing great work. We were doing great works for kids, great work for families, great work for communities. Uh, the very few instances where we said this is, not, um, this is not a circumstance that we want to participate in there were other approved uh, entities doing the same thing. 
that we could refer it out to. And when I saw the state muscling um, Catholic social services and other faith-based institutions, I got very concerned. Uh, you look at what's happening nationally, uh, I'm seeing a deterioration uh, in important quarters for our constitutional rights, for the rule of law. And it's in the appellate court uh, that you're able to fight that more vigorously, more successfully. Appellate courts, in a sense, make law, case law. And explain the what difference. What they call common law. Mm -hmm. Explain the difference between what case law is and what statutory law is. The legislature will write a statute, and it's signed into law by the governor. Uh, that's that's the law. That along with the our, our constitution. And that's what you're supposed to follow. And as so a you judge. read that and say, all right, here here's a statute that governing this this particular set of circumstances or transaction of events, and so long as the statute is uh, constitutional, we will follow that as the law and say, uh, you, you guys have to live with it. But there are a lot of cases that are decided on common law. Uh, the best example would be a determination of what would a reasonable person do under the circumstances. You know, you're driving along uh, and uh, you can, uh, you know, you see an accident coming, um, you break, you swerve, you know, what do you do? What would a reasonably prudent person do under those circumstances? The statutes can't tell us what, you know, they can't, they can't regulate every single uh, transaction of events. What would a reasonable doctor do under circumstances with a patient presenting with certain complaints and certain symptoms? Those are all things that ultimately, if there's a dispute over what a reasonable person would do, they end up in the courts. And it's the courts uh, that make the decision Here's the test to, that we would follow. Here's what we think a reasonably, per, reasonably prudent person would do, or this is something that's below the minimum standard that we would expect from a professional like a lawyer or an, or an architect or an accountant. Uh, that's common law, that's judge-made law. Mm -hmm. It just seems to me that over a period of, of decades, that in America, you know, we started with something over here, and then a judge or an appellate judge is asked, well, judge, yeah, it's, it has been this way, but I want you to make just a little exception. And then the next time it comes, well, this judge made that exception. We want you to go one more step and make this next exception. And over a period of years, suddenly the law, which was here, suddenly is over here, where it was common that in um, public places there could be a crash, there could be religious symbols to where now religious symbols are just verboten. Well, I agree. There's a, a, a classic example. That's, that's of that. one example, but there's, well, there's, there's another much example more egregious of a, right, examples of, of that. Of a school district telling a kid he can't have a U.S. flag on his bike on the school campus because it would be disruptive. That's ridiculous. Yeah, how do, you, I blame, how do you make you law? You have to hold. <laughs> oh, by the way, we got five minutes, so okay. we're, we're, we're down to that. So I don't want to spend a whole lot of time arguing about this point. I won't argue about it, but I'll just say this. You have to, judges are responsible for that. Lawyers are always trying to push the envelope for their clients. And there's always a set of circumstances that they're trying to push. The judges have to see the big picture, and they have to, to make sure that, uh, that they keep things within a reasonable boundary. Because once a, a lawyer pushes the envelope in one case, all the other ones fall in behind it. And that's how you keep getting this expanded, you keep getting this expanded arc of reach of the power of the courts or a created liability where there didn't used to be. Right. So the judges have a, a duty to look at that and not only understand how your decision is gonna impact the litigants that are in front of you, but what impact it may have on the community at large or other people that are looking at this case and saying, all right, what, how should we, how should we uh, act ourselves? Uh, does this expose us to lawsuits? Does it, does it not expose us to lawsuits? So you have to be able to see the big picture and understand the impact of your decisions. And a lot of those bad decisions may have been well-intended, but their impact has been dramatic because the judge didn't, didn't look at the big picture and say, um, what would this decision rot on our community? It oftentimes seems to me that you have bad actors and then all of a sudden either we pass a law or we have a court case 
that has a much, much larger impact than as if we just dealt with the one bad actor. You, you, there are some times where a case lends itself to making broad statements. But there are a lot of cases that you have where you have a bad actor, but you want to make sure that you don't uh, overstate things. Uh, or maybe you have a sympathetic person. You know, I had a case where they were evaluating a, a middle-aged woman with a bipolar disorder that wasn't uh, taking her medicine. And there was involuntary uh, 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 placing her in a facility. And the Supreme Court thought, under those circumstances, it wasn't very good to do that. That wasn't fair. But they give a very broad statement. I have the sexually violent persons cases, the sexual predator cases, sexually dangerous cases, and they'll read those, those decisions, and they'll try to take advantage of whatever loopholes are opened up for people that really aren't a threat to themselves, but are involuntarily committed for one reason or another. And I had that in the appellate court. And, and uh, I could see, I, I, I saw this case and there were, there were some of my colleagues that thought this guy had, was able to game the system. I wrote a decision that said, no, you're not getting out. Uh, these, this type of exception is not designed for people who are being held because they're preying on small children or are vulnerable. This is for somebody who's struggling with a mental illness that really doesn't, re doesn't represent a risk of harm to others. She just was a risk of harm to herself. And this is where the person who sits in the judge's seat makes a difference as to which way they're going to see the way that this whole series of case law brings the state of the law. Correct. So, and that's why, so who your judges are matters. I think you have to have um, experience. You have to have a proven record of being fair, of being willing to listen. You can't be one of these guys that thinks, I know how the story's going to end. I don't need to hear all the facts. You have to have had the experience. Are there judges like that? There are judges like that, brother, <laughs> unfortunately. But, but you have to have that experience of sitting through a trial and listening and seeing. I think it's going one way, I think it's going one way, and then the very last witness or the very last piece of evidence changes the entire outcome. And you think, ah, um, now I see. Here's what the just result is, and I didn't think it was going that way. Um, the more experience you have, the better you are at, at, at seeing these uh, problems that you can create for yourself, for your community, even when you're, you're well-intended, well-intentioned. Well, we've run just about out of our time. I, I appreciate your coming here today to speak to us. Um, I, uh, I, sometimes I just shake my head over uh, my, my view, and I'm not an attorney, but my view of the court uh, and the way I have seen it. I like some of the things that I've heard you say here, and it gives me hope that perhaps the courts are still rational and that I'm just missing the point. Well, thanks for saying that. It is, you know, there's a lot, we have the best system when it's run properly. You get the right people in there to do it. We've got the best judicial system in the world. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And to my uh, audience, I've been speaking to Judge uh, Stephen McLean. He'll be on the ballot in November. Thank you.